On today's episode of Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, I'm going to accuse State Park Manager Rich Donaher of operating Maine's best kept secret. Well, it is, I guess, and it's one of the uh, top ten rated hidden beaches in the U.S. And I was on the, uh, I caught that on the Facebook last week. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> Who rated it? Do you know? Uh, I don't know, but. Yeah. Uh, well, it is a secret. I mean, most Mainers, I swear, don't know about it. If you already know this beach, you can skip the middle part of the show. Good morning, I'm Bob Duchesne. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, and we'll get a private tour of that secret state park in a little while. But first, we're going to see if we can't put a little more wild into the American Folk Festival, which is coming up next weekend. Some people can walk there from home. Most people drive in and scramble for a place to park. But you can also get there by bike and by boat. We'll tell you how in a moment. Today's show is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Dice Arts, EBS, and Supercuts, Bangor Brewer, and Old Town. Ever since the Folk Festival came to Bangor, you've had the option of biking to the waterfront. And somebody will watch over your bike for the whole time you're there. And they'll do it for free. This year, they've moved the bike tent over near the railroad stage. Meaning this year, you can pedal in, get off the bike, and you're right there at the biggest stage. And right next to the beer tent. Can life get any better? Steve Ropiak is the bike tent chair. So welcome to the program, Steve. Thank you. The basics of the bike tent. Now, we've had this bike tent since the very first festival. A lot of people know about it, but not everybody knows how to use it properly. So how do you use the bike tent? Well, it's a very simple concept. We like to keep things simple. When the cyclists arrive, we check their bike in, we have them sign their log, and we give them a receipt for their bicycle. While they're enjoying the festival, we keep their bike in a secure location. And when it's time for them to leave, they present their half of the ticket with their assistance, we match the ticket with the bicycle and send them on their way. And is there any cost? It is free to all of the festival attendees. Excellent. Now, what if you want to store stuff? You bring stuff on your bike and you can't really carry it around with you. Can you store it with the bike or is that a problem? Uh, no problem at all. We have uh, not a large number, but a fair number of cyclists. We have backpacks or tag-alongs for kids, strollers. We've taken in uh, skateboards and other various wheeled vehicles, and all are kept in the same safe location with the bicycles. What is the location? Because you moved it this year. People are going to be a little confused if they're looking in the old place. New this year is we will on the, be on the corner of Railroad and Main Street. So for the first time in quite a while, you're actually going to be in front of one of the performances, and volunteers who are staffing the tent actually get to have some fun. Exactly. We have kind of been hung out in the, in the left wing for a number of years, and finally they have brought us to the forefront of the festival, will be in a highly visible location, and hopefully that will prompt people who hadn't considered it before to ride their bicycle to the festival. Well, that's just it. Uh, if anyone who's driving a car in is going to have to park somewhere distant, either take a bus over here or, or walk down some distance carrying their stuff, if you go in by bike, you actually get out of the bike tent right in front of the railroad stage, you arrive, and you're there. Exactly, and that's one of the advantages of bike cycling is the fact that you're parking it right at the festival itself. There's no long walk or bus ride to get to the height of the activity. There must be some strategy for doing this right, because a lot of people want to bring in folding chairs, picnic baskets, whatever. Hard to carry stuff on a bike. How do people do it, from your observations? Well, you, you learn to minimize. I've been cycling to cycle community to work for a number of years, and I've found that you know you really have to plan ahead. Like for myself, I will plan a car day where I will stock up sufficient clothing to get me through the week or any other vital necessities I might need for the course of my work week so that I'm free to cycle on the off days. Okay. What about people who want to stay right till the last performance is done? Uh, is there somebody staffing the tent until after the performances? We stay until the last bicycle is gone. <laughs> That's kind of risky, isn't it, for that last volunteer? Uh, actually, no. I've, I've manned that shift myself for the last couple of years. And What about city streets at night, though? Aren't some cyclists a little bit worried about biking all over downtown and nighttime traffic? Well, actually, the tra there's much less traffic at night in, Bang in the Bangor, greater Bangor Brewer area than there is during the day. So in terms of you know, congestion and traffic, it really is kind of the optimal time to ride, provided you have sufficient lighting on your bike. Mm -hmm. People do this for a number of different reasons, and some, some people just come a very short distance. They may just come from home if they live in Bangor. Some will park in the outskirts of town to get good parking and then bike in and out. Uh, so they can arrive at the right place with minimal stuff. How many different strategies do you think you see in the course of a day? 
I think the majority of our riders come within the greater area. Most of them come like 8, 10 miles or less, although we do have some people that will park their cars, say, up at the steam plant at UMaine or out at the Walmart and Brewer and then bike down the last three or four miles. You know, it just depends on your personal preference, and you have to adapt to your own personal situation. And for a lot of years, and I don't know if you still do this, but you actually keep track of who came the farthest. Uh, is that still something that you keep track of? Uh, we had for a number of years, but it was sort of information that was underutilized and not really uh, taken advantage of, so we stopped collecting those statistics of a few years ago. Although last year we had a couple who had biked down from from Callis to the <laughs> festival. Uh, so the bike tent is, once again, the railroad stage. It's free. When, when's the staffing start? About an hour ahead, two hours ahead of the festival? Somebody's usually on site from 10.30 in the morning, and we stay until the last bicycle is picked up, typically after midnight on Friday and Saturday. That's Steve Ropiak, who chairs the bike tent at the American Folk Festival. You ride in, they watch your stuff. It's a free service run entirely by volunteers, and it just might be the most convenient way to attend the festival. But you might get an argument from those who go to the festival by boat. You can motor in. You can paddle in. Bangor has a harbor master, and he's my next guest. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. The American Folk Festival is on the Bangor waterfront next weekend. While the destination is amazing, getting there can be part of the fun. Most folks park and walk or park and then hop on a courtesy bus. Some folks come in by water. Jerry Ledwith is the Bangor Harbor Master, and if anyone knows how it's done, he's the one. So let's put the question to him. Jerry, welcome to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Uh, can you boat to the Folk Festival? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes. How does that yep. work? Uh, well, uh, people come from all over eastern Maine, eastern central Maine. Uh, They'll come in from as far away as Rockland going south and uh, probably uh, Blue Hill and uh, even further east to Jonesport coming in this way. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, there's all, only a limited amount of people who can do it because you run out of space fast. So how do you, uh, yes. you, how that, do you deal with that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the best way to do, if anybody's interested uh, coming to the Folk Festival by boat, by watercraft, would be to call the Bangor Parks and Rec Department at 992 Four four nine zero, and the uh, young lady that will answer the phone will take reservations as long as the the dock space holds up, mm -hmm. and um, uh, she'll do that. Like I say, until the dock space is gone, it is very limited. Uh, so the sooner you call, the better. And there's mooring space as well, or do you tie up to the dock and leave it there? No, you tie to the dock. Okay, right. All right, uh, how about uh, canoes and kayaks? Can you yeah. come in that way? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can. Um, I, I urge caution for any uh, uh, canoes and kayaks on the river, only because sometimes you're hard to see. <laughs> uh, but uh, for those who would be coming by uh, paddlecraft, we have a paddlecraft dock um, specifically for that type of watercraft, and uh, it's built low to the water. It makes entering and exiting your boat a lot easier. Um, again, it's limited. Uh, it's um, you know there is a there is a point where you can't get any more on. So is this a case where you should call and make reservations for even a paddlecraft too? Uh, technically, no. Okay. Uh, that one we pretty much just leave open. Uh, um, but again, it's it's probably something that you know. Uh, you, you'll, if, you, if you wish to attend and, and use your kayak, your canoe, what have you, uh, you probably want to come early. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and leave the unfortunate who come late uh, struggling for a place to go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I got that okay. Is, uh, when you actually get there with your boat or your canoe or kayak, do you pull it up on land and store it there, or do you tie it up somewhere? No, actually you tie it to our paddle craft dock. Okay. Yeah. Is there a secure storage for paddles and that sort of thing, or you just leave there it is, There is not. Okay. So you want to make sure that you can um, keep everything quite secure within the, your craft itself. A lot of people carry these little locks that lock it to the side of the boat, uh, that sort of thing. What about uh, tides? Because I've not paddled that section of the river, so <laughs> is there any advice you would give uh, paddlers about uh, paddling the tides getting up to the Folk Festival? Yeah, I would give it to anyone. It's, uh, you know, we have between a 9 and 11 foot tide. 
uh, depending on the time of year. And uh, uh, so if you're mobility constrained, those gangways get to be pretty steep um, at low water. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Uh, Other than that, however, there's no difference in navigation up to the docks, be it high water or low water. Well, I'm just wondering how hard you have to paddle if you're coming against the tide. (laughs) Well, if you're coming against the tide, then it's a little bit more of a chore, certainly. Okay. Um, Oh, yes. Yeah. How about night? If if somebody wants to uh, come in early, as you say, and then stay all day and into the night, does that present any challenges for paddlers uh, in the dark? Um, Okay. In the dark, they're going to have to meet all federal requirements just like... um, just as anyone would in a power craft, they're going to have to have an all-around white light um, so they can be seen. Um, I do not recommend um, paddling in the Penobscot River late at night only because it is just so dark. Um, unless you're right in the city vicinity, um, it's, it's really, really dark. Uh, it, it's very difficult to see anything. And if you're in a low-riding canoe or kayak uh, and there's a powerboat coming up behind you, he's probably not going to see you. So mm-hmm. I, I would give a lot of caution to somebody. Oh, you know, those who are experienced are fine, but be, be aware that at, at night on the Penobscot, it's very dark. It can be dangerous if, uh, if you can't be seen. Uh, the nice thing about once you get here and you're tied up, you're right smack in the <laughs> middle of it. You are right. You are ground center to it. So right yeah. next to the Two River Stage. Does people yeah. actually? Um, can you actually watch any of the music of the Two River Stage from the river? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Well, a lot of people just sit out in the river. Not just the Two River Stage, yeah. but uh, pretty much all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, that's another thing too. I mean, a lot of people just come up for a couple hours, sit in the river, and listen to a little music, and then go on their way. So you know, mm-hmm. um, keeping that in mind. You yeah, know, if the weather's uh, good, that could be a fun way to do it. That's right. That's right. And that's another thing to uh, keep one eye on the weather and one eye on the schedule of events. The weather can change very quickly, and uh, if you're in a small open boat, well, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So you know. On the other hand, it wouldn't be Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine unless something lent a little wildness to it. My thanks to Jerry Litwith, the Bangor Harbor Master, for clearing all this up. On the way next, it's a state park. It's been named one of the most secluded beaches in America. What is it? The park director takes us on a tour in just a moment. This is Sports Radio 929, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Saturday mornings at 9, Sunday mornings at 8 on Sports Radio 929, The Ticket. This portion of today's show takes place in a state park. At the top of the show, I asked you if you might know which one I'm talking about, since it has sometimes been listed as one of the top 10 most secluded beaches in America. I'll give you a hint it's on the ocean, though it also has a freshwater pond for warmer family swimming. The saltwater beach is so completely shielded from the road by an immense row of beach roses that you can't see the beach, even though you're just 30 yards from it. Oh, one more hint, it's down east. Can you name this park? I'm at Rope Bluff State Park. The park superintendent is Rich Donaher, and welcome to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Bob, thank you. Great to be here, and uh, thanks for coming out to the uh, park on this gorgeous August day. Yeah, okay, let's let's describe where we are. We're actually sitting near the maintenance shed. We have a, a tent set up for group gatherings. We're overlooking the bay, and I forget the name of the bay. I don't, I'm not sure it has a, techn- a uh, technical <laughs> name to it. You know, everything back here does, and yeah. over there does, but this is this is basically part of the uh, open ocean right here. Mm-hmm. And uh, So we're looking down the beach. It's a beautiful day in August, and yet there's almost nobody on the beach, and that's typical well it is for this time of day yeah. you know we've mm-hmm. got a lot of families and a lot of vacationers in the area and they'll kind of show up at 11 o'clock or mm-hmm. noon and by uh by the middle of the afternoon i expect that we'll have a pretty good crowd out here mm-hmm. well roke bluff state park is this maine's best kept secret well it is i guess and it's one of the uh, top 10 rated hidden beaches in the u.s and that was on the uh 
I caught that on the Facebook last week. Did was, you? Yeah. <laughs> Who rated it? Do you know? Uh, I don't know, but... Yeah. Uh, well, it is a secret. I mean, most Mainers, I swear, don't know about it. Well, the, the interesting thing is we have this int- this whole row of um, the wild rose bushes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you really can't see the beach um, as you drive along the road, and uh, that kind of keeps it hidden from, from view, too. Mm-hmm. So are there bluffs? How well... We? <laughs> <laughs> I look around, I say, I, I wouldn't say bluffs, <laughs> but uh, so... How did it get its name? That's a million-dollar question, and, you know, I've been looking for the person that named it Roke Bluffs since I've been here, and I've been here for eight years. But really, the bluffs are be down, would be further down the road here. Down to the Shoppy only, Point? Or? Yes, mm-hmm. down this uh, Shoppy Point Road, and the only way to see them is by boat. Oh, so someone who would be sailing up here would have named it after what they could see from the ocean, probably. Probably, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Well, what the, what's the Roke part? Do you know? That was, of course, we're a spinoff from Jonesboro. Yeah. This was Jonesboro back in the day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, Ted likes, Ted, uh, my ranger here, likes to think that the pirates come in here, and that's that's (laughs) where the rope came from. Is that? (laughs) That can't be it. No, that's not it, but that's his his version. And, you know, if I'm going to tell stories. May as well make it a good story. Make it a good one, yeah. I I was originally thinking maybe it's French for rock, but that's not quite the right spelling. No. There's Roquefort cheese, so maybe it's named (laughs) after somebody. I I never did come up with the right answer for what Roque is. No, it's it's kind of a mystery, you know, between the Roque and the Bluffs, and Mm -hmm. where are the Bluffs, and uh, Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's an interesting name, to be sure. What is the actual history of Roque Bluff State Park? Well, the uh, the state started to put together a few uh, parcels of land with the idea of making up a park here. And that t- t- took place in the uh, mid-60s, mm-hmm. around 65, 66, 67 in that area. And then uh, right around the uh, 70s, early 70s is when it uh, gradually became the park. And a lot of these parks started off, you know, kind of low profile. Mm-hmm. And then uh, as the years went by, we sort of put them together so they'd be more functional. And, uh, you know, with parking and toilet facilities and uh, made sure the a- access was t- for the public was safe and uh, mm-hmm. adequate, things yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Of all the state parks along the main coast, I can't think of any park that has both beach and trail system. Anywhere and, from Kittery on up. And Freshwater Pond. In Freshwater Pond, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty unique. Yeah. I and mean, is that why this park ended up here, because of those unique features? or? Well, I think so. Um, um, you know, this this piece of real estate right here is, is worth quite a bit. And then, of course, on the other side of our hiking trails, that has a big chunk of ocean frontage as well. Mm-hmm. So when you add it all up, you've got... You've got quite a bit of um, real estate with um, water access to it. I probably come to Roke Bluff State Park six to eight times a summer, uh-huh. either leading birding groups or by myself. And um, <laughs> this is really one of the birdier places because you get all the gulls that collect over in the freshwater and bathe. I can see five to six species of gulls at once in August. <laughs> That's always pretty cool. And the terns I'm watching right now coming in close because they're starting to fledge their chicks and they're going all over the place now. Well, this is a, this is a seabird heaven for sure. Yeah. And uh, it's songbird as well. I mean, mm-hmm. with with the marsh we have over between the ocean and the freshwater pond, it's a perfect environment. Well, yeah, more yellow birds. warblers in these bushes than anywhere else in Maine. I know, and they are pretty, aren't they? <laughs> they yeah. are. We do, uh, you know, we have the red-winged blackbirds here, mm-hmm. and they're uh, sort of my favorite neighbors because they have a <laughs> kind of a unique and pretty song to them, mm-hmm. and uh, and they're just kind of fun to watch. Mm. Finish this sentence. Roke Bluff State Park is most famous for blank. I think it's the the atmosphere that you get when you drive through town and come by the chapel and make the make the right hand turn and come down over the hill mm-hmm. and then you look out and you can see the ocean you can see the pond you can see the rose bushes and it just has a very relaxing feel to it and of course there's no nothing commercial out here at all yeah so that that makes it very nice as well well it's kind of unique and isolated i mean you're, you're off route one you've got to get eight miles off route one just to get to this spot uh, so it is secluded. The beach is secluded because you can't even see the road because of the rose bushes. All you got is ocean in front of you. It's a pretty unique spot. Yeah, it's just beautiful here. Um, and uh, one of the draws for the young families and the young children is they can swim in the freshwater pond because it gets mm-hmm. nice and warm. Is it clean enough? Because the birds go over there and bathe. There's it, beavers in there. You know, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things going on in that pond, but it's never been an issue as far as any health concerns. Is that right? Okay. Customers, yeah. Well, because on the ocean side, the water temperature is a little bit cooler than liquid nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see people going in the ocean side very often. Well, when I go in, you know, I get the initial headache. Yeah. 
and then the numbness, you know, in the lower limbs. You'd have to be numb to go in in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the end of August, early September, we get one of those spikes in the temperature when mm-hmm. it gets really warm. Mm-hmm. That's the time to go in. Yep. As uh, I've been coming here over the years, I'm always seeing the big party tent up. This seems to be a place to have events that the local community knows about. Nobody else does, but the locals know that this is a good place to have an, a function. Well, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, we want to you know, give my predecessor, Larry Hunter, credit because mm-hmm. he's the person that um, donated the tent to the park. And uh, we've had a chance to have a lot of fun with it, you know, do weddings, funerals. We've done, uh, we had a baby shower here last Saturday. We've got, um, the hospital is going to have their um, annual family picnic day here in a few weeks. Um, so there's always something going on, but it's very, very reasonable cost-wise mm. to come here with your group. And, uh, you know, we go out of our way to make sure that uh, people um, have a good time. Mm-hmm. This park and Quaddy Head State Park are the reason I buy an annual state park pass. <laughs> and you know the number one reason why? No. The bathrooms. <laughs> the outhouses. <laughs> when I lead tour groups, I've got to have a place that has multiple <laughs> multiple facilities. And so you've got clusters of outhouses that I can't find anywhere else in Washington County. It, that's a big draw because, um, <laughs> you know, when people drive an hour and a half, two hours to get here, yeah. the first thing they enjoy is the, the view, mm-hmm. and the second thing they do is head for the outhouses just as quickly as they can yeah. because uh, they've been driving for a while. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If I pick somebody up at Ellsworth or a group uh, at Scudic Point, for instance, and we come up here, they've got to hold it till we get to Rope Bluff State right. Park <laughs> because um, from Ellsworth to at least Lubeck, I can think of... Only four locations that are two holders. There's the Irving and Machias. Mm-hmm. There's here. There's Quaddy Head State Park, and there's the Campobello Visitor Center. Other than that, if I stop anywhere else, it's a long line, and we're going to lose 45 minutes. Right. <laughs> well, you know, we go out of our way to keep this, to keep the bathrooms as clean as we mm-hmm. can, because that's the second or third impression when people come to our park, mm-hmm. and you know, we want to keep that positive um, impression going mm-hmm. as long as we can. Well, as a park manager, what is your number one headache? Is it clean bathrooms? Is it Hiker safety, is it getting people to pay? <laughs> well, here is, uh, you know, this is the fourth park that I've worked at in my career. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, each park has its own set of problems that come with it. This one probably has the least of any. You know, vandalism hardly exists at all here. <laughs> There's virtually um, nothing to vandalize. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, what are you going to do, tip over a picnic table? That's <laughs> <Right>. about it. <laughs> um, we... Uh, you know, dogs are the number one problem in state parks. Mm-hmm. Loose dogs, mm-hmm. dogs on the beach, uh, things like that. So, we, you know, we have to keep an eye on that. And again, that's really not a problem here. Um, it's uh, probably on the stress meter this is probably probably the least stressful place I've ever worked. Yeah, yeah. I would think so. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a beautiful spot, not a whole lot of infrastructure, not a whole lot of usage. So No, no, all those things are nice. So. And is it true you're only the second manager this park has ever had? That's right, 38 wow. years, yep. 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 38 years, and you've been doing it for eight, so your predecessor, Larry Hunter, did it for 30 years? 30 years, yeah, oh, and he, uh, he's a character. He's <laughs> His spirit is everywhere around this park, and I mm-hmm. feel it every day when I'm here. Is there anybody in this neck of the woods that isn't a character? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so true, Bob. I mean, did, and I think that's what makes this area what it is, is mm-hmm. because of the characters. Mm-hmm. You know, I grew up in Greenville, and I worked. I started my career at Lily Bay State Park mm-hmm. up on Moosehead, and uh, Greenville is a place of characters as well. <laughs> yes, <it is>. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we hop on uh, the buggy and go take a look around? The sure, park? let's okay. check it out. Okay, this will take us a minute to get up to the beginning of the park tour, so this is a good time to let the sponsors have their say. I'll meet you up at the Ranger Cabin in a couple of minutes. I'm with Rich Donaher, manager of Roke Bluff State Park. We sometimes get credited with having one of the most secluded beaches in North America. And it's far enough off the beaten track that most Mainers don't know about it. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket with Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. We're taking a quick tour of Roke Bluff State Park. This is the Ranger Cabin. This is the Ranger Cabin? <laughs> I have to go say hi to my dog. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rich Donaher is the park manager, and we've just pulled into the driveway of what Rich calls the Ranger Cabin. It's actually a house, a nice one, with a view to die for. And better yet, there is a dog in the yard. Riley, I brought you a new friend. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) 
I mean, is there any other ranger cabin, so to speak, in Maine with a view better than this? No. No. Or as new as this. Or as new, yeah. yeah. How'd that happen? Well, this was, uh, uh, I think I told you before, Larry Hunter lived in a trailer down there by the maintenance garage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when the toilet fell through the floor, <laughs> that was that was the uh, the breaking point. It was time to do something. And uh, he actually stayed in another cottage up the road here for a year or two. And uh, the powers that be put this plan together and they, mm -hmm. uh, they built this house back when in 1999, 2000. When I was down to the picnic tables all, all these years, I never realized this was part of the park up here. Yeah. I'd yeah. always look up here and say, hey, you hear the alder flycatcher calling from that yard up there? <laughs> 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 I didn't know that was part of the park. Well, it starts right about there where that, tree, that row of spruce trees is. Mm -hmm. And then it goes all the way around to the other side of the pond mm -hmm. and uh, all the way up through the hiking trails. It's about yep. probably 200 plus yard, uh, acres of land up mm -hmm. there, the, the, the par part of the park. I guess the next thing that occurs to me as I'm standing here looking at this lovely view is that in May and June, it's got to be a little buggy right in this spot. Well, you know, the, I came from the land of black flies, Moosehead, yeah. Greenville. Well, that's right, yeah, so that's nothing. And there's no black flies here because... There's no running water here. There's, uh, there's no woods. I yeah. Mean, this is just open here. Mm -hmm. uh, we get the mosquitoes. We'll start um, around dusk and dark just through that period as you go through the spring and early summer. And as you go through... July now into August, you'll mm -hmm. see that the mosquitoes will will gain an in intensity mm -hmm. um, through the month, and they get they get pretty pretty rugged. <laughs> <laughs> but only at dawn and dusk. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, this is uh, every morning when I get up, I uh, come downstairs and mm -hmm. get a cup of coffee and look out the window and make sure that the pond's still there. <laughs> so I check that off my list, and yeah. then I turn to the right and make sure the ocean's still there. Yep. Check that off my list, and then I'm I'm good to go for the rest of the day. And really, is there anything else you have to do in winter? No, case. I'm actually, uh, I'm off in the wintertime. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a seasonal job, essentially. Yes, it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, that I've spent all the winters that I've been here, right here in uh, the house in the park, and uh, January, February, gets, it gets pretty quiet, and, mm -hmm. you get, and you get used to that. <laughs> and then, then the spring breaks and people start to show up. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, well, well, what do they want? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you people go away and stop bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you gradually, you know, you... You get used to the, uh, mm -hmm. the the spring, the summer, the season, and now, you know, like yeah. yesterday, we had just a record crowd here. It was just amazing. I could stand here and tell you for 20 minutes how powerful the winter storms are, but until you were standing <laughs> here or in the house for a nor'easter and taking those 60-mile-an-hour winds direct hit into mm -hmm. the front of this building, um, you'd realize how intense they are. It's, and I gauge the storms here by how many shingles fly off the roofs. <laughs> <laughs> was there a time this winter where you simply couldn't leave the house because there was so much snow? Yeah, so we get stranded in here for four days. Did you, yeah, yeah. Two plow guys tried to break through, and they couldn't do it. So yeah. we had to get a front-end loader to actually uh, open the road up. <laughs> Is there anything in particular that you lost that you regret? Well, I've, I had a grill, uh -huh. big Weber grill like that, yeah. um, that I had for 15 years. And I had it out here in the front lawn, and we had it. This is a fall storm, mm -hmm. and it blew that grill and that's a big rugged grill blew it right over on its side and broke it into about three pieces oh, and uh they said that's it you know mm -hmm. i'm gonna tie everything down so mm -hmm. you know you learn you learn how to <laughs> what to take care of yeah all right let's go examine more of the park okay yeah back in the golf cart and down through the park the pond side is mostly picnic area there's a place to swim in the freshwater pond there's a volleyball court. There are kayaks for public use. We're heading towards a strange granite sculpture near the entry of the park. Lehman, say hello to Bob Duchesne. This is Lehman Falkenham. How do you do? How you doing? It's nice to meet you. <laughs> meet you. Yeah. He's a native of Beals Island. Beals Island. Great water town. Yeah, there's a lot of people with your name in the cemetery over there. <laughs> 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 it's like Norton, Jones, <laughs> yeah. Beals, yeah. Alley, yeah. Buckingham. Yeah. I don't know how I got mixed in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, we're now at the north end, the north entrance, and there are two entrances to the beach area, mm -hmm. two parking lots, and two sets of facilities, and we're at the more popular end because people just hit the one they come to first. <laughs> Yes, this is the first thing they see, and uh, it's just, you know, it's it's colorful, and it's uh, the kayaks are here, and uh, the sculpture's here, and mm -hmm. the big sign's here, so this it looks like this is, you know, where they, all the action is. This yeah. is where they stop. Mm -hmm. The sculpture, that's not been there a long time. 
No. What is it, and how did it get there? Well, as part of the uh, Scudic uh, International um, Sculpture Symposium, mm-hmm. um, and uh, we were approached uh, back, um, gosh, what year was it, 2010, by the folks that were putting together six sculptures for that particular um, two-year period out of um, Jesse Salisbury, who was the director of that. He lives mm-hmm. in Steuben. And we were approached by one of his people about putting a sculpture in the park, but the uh, the attractive thing was is because we're a state facility that we had a ten thousand um, dollar grant to start the project. Mm. So we had to come up with another five. T- we raised ourselves, mm-hmm. which we did, and it was uh, you know it's harder than you think, but it's also <laughs> when it, once it gets going, it, yeah. it really kind of takes on a life of its own. And we had some donors, and it worked out pretty well. But the the interesting thing is you don't know what you're going to get. Well, when I look at it right now, it looks like an eel holding a bar of soap. <laughs> and that's the beauty of this particular sculpture, so is it looks something different. Uh, my uh, colleague, uh, John Smith, who worked at the Lighthouse for years, now he's working as a, as a maintenance coordinator, he claims that that's a brook trout holding an Oreo cookie in his mouth. <laughs> Is there any indication of what it is supposed to actually represent? No. And, and, you know, that's the thing about art, which I didn't know a lot of when I get into the sculpture business. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been educated quite a bit. And, uh, you know, it can be whatever you want it to be. And when the sun shines on it, different angles, it changes. When there's a little bit of snow on it or it's a little bit of shower, so half of it is wet, half mm-hmm. of it is dry. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, it is pretty cool. I mean, there's some out there that are interesting-looking sculptures. Yeah. And it's hard to, you know, get your... Well, does any other state park in the state have a sculpture? Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, Lemoyne State Park has Do one. They? Oh, yep. Yep. It's been years since I've been over to Lemoyne. Yep, yep, they have one. Another one of those best-kept secrets, I think. <laughs> yes, it is. And that's, you know, that's pretty close to the Ellsworth Bar Harbor. Yeah, yeah. that's because everyone goes to Ellsworth and Bar Harbor right. and go over to Lemoyne. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a difference down east. Nobody really takes that left-hand turn and heads down Route 1, so... Mm-hmm. That's a great population neutralizer. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of the last hotel room that was ever constructed in Washington County, and it's probably been decades. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's another inter- interesting thing about out here is the the development is just non-existent. Mm. You know, there's always a home or two being built that you really can't see on the ocean. But um, well, that's why I come up to Washington County is I love it <laughs> with because I don't have to share it with a lot of people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Let's step across the street, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we see offshore okay. here at the north end of the park. Yeah, And this is, you know, when the visitors first come for the first time and they want to look at the ocean, they park here in this little lot mm-hmm. and gaze down at the beach, and I'm sure their first impression is, oh, my God. <laughs> well, the unique thing about this spot right here mm-hmm. is the access to see the open ocean. Right. I mean, most of the places you see anywhere on the coast, especially down east, is, you know, you don't get to see this. Mm-hmm. All the way to Nova Scotia, I guess, would be the next. Not land much here between <laughs> between us and there. Of course, you're looking out at Roke Island out yeah. here. In, um, yeah, I've been on that a number of times because yeah. uh, Maine Audubon has done trips over to Roke Island in November several times to do all the seabirds coming in. Right. Yeah. And that's a lot of fun. Yeah, that place is amazing. I get yeah. to spend a day over there with my neighbors who worked there a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's hard to describe what it is over there. Yeah. You know, full working farm. With, with no fences, so the horses can roam it round at will. And so when I'm out there eating my lunch, a horse will come over and grab my sandwich. Yes, yes. <laughs> the little bugger. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story, by the way. On an island, there's no big need to fence in the livestock. They're not going anywhere. The last time I was on Roke Island, one of the horses just walked up, reached over my shoulder, and grabbed my lunch. I'm with Rich Donher, manager of Roke Bluff State Park, which has made several lists as one of the most secluded beaches in America. I just did a quick Google search just now, and it comes up number three out of seven most secluded beaches on U.S. News and World Report. It's number nine on ShermanTravel.com, an expert travel blog, and it does get quoted that way on Facebook. We're back on the golf cart and headed up to the trails. Now I'll meet you at the trailhead in a couple of minutes. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. We're at Roke Bluff State Park. Park manager Rich Donaher has been driving me around to this golf cart, taking a close look at everything. Now remember, this is an ocean beach that is so secluded, it makes top ten lists of the most secluded beaches in America. 
in Maine. It's the only coastal state park that has ocean swimming and fresh water swimming in the 60-acre pond behind the beach and a hiking trail system. So we're in the Trailhead parking lot. I, as I say, I've, I've walked some of these trails. Um, I have not done them all. How many miles of trail is there? You could probably, um, if you did all the trails and all the little um, um, little spur trails that are mm-hmm. off them, and you kind of married them all together, you could probably get about two and a half miles of hiking mm-hmm. without really retracing your steps. Were the trails there before the park was, or were the trails put in specifically for the park? Larry Hunter. Did he? Did yeah. these trails, yeah. Did he have a rhyme or reason for how he laid them out, do you know? I, we, we never talked about that. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, th- he did a beautiful job, mm-hmm. and the people really enjoy them. I enjoy them. Folks come out here and get a chance to walk their dogs, and uh, it's a nice leg stretcher, and a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different views. Mm-hmm. Uh, the highest point of the trails is about 500 feet above sea level, and that's up on My Hill Trail. Um, we've got the Pond Cove Trail, which runs right along the backside of um, Simps- Simpson Pond here. And, you know, it's uh, a good chance to see wildlife. Um, yeah, like what? Deer. Deer, yeah. Deer, deer rabbits. Mm-hmm. Um, we've run into a few porcupines with my dog on occasion, and that's not been a good day. <laughs> How about moose? <laughs> no moose. The moose kind of, uh, you know, I come from moose country. Yeah, you yeah. Know, where I grew up in Greenville, and uh, occasionally a moose kind of rambles through the neighborhood and Generally visits about everybody living on the ocean mm-hmm. side here, and um, but that's every couple of years, couple three years. They're not they're not around much. In June, I had a very funny experience. We mm-hmm. were leading a, a birding trip down this way, mm-hmm. and uh, with a gr- bunch of people who really wanted to see moose, but I said, "No, we never see them at the coast." We get past the park. We're halfway to Shoppy Point. There are two moose standing in the road. <laughs> <laughs> this was this year in June. Whoa. I said, "My God, I've never seen moose down here." <laughs> It's rare. Yeah. It's rare. And, and you're lucky to be able to, to see one. Yeah. Um, My recollection is these trails are actually pretty easy. There's not a lot of big roots and rocks and stuff in the way. No. No. They are pretty easy. Yeah. yeah. It's a nice moderate hike for most folks. So I would think you don't have that many people hurting themselves in here. E- occasionally. But yeah. you're right. It's not, yeah. not many. Mm-hmm. No. Not it's, compared to maybe some other places. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Do you want to walk down and just yeah, take a peek? Yeah. Let's do that. Essentially, what is your season? Are you done by Columbus Day weekend? or No, uh, the end of October. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then the park is officially closed, but obviously people can still use the trails? They do, and, you know, I keep the, uh, you know, I keep to- uh, toilet paper in the bathrooms, mm-hmm. and I keep- make sure that the, uh, the access is um, safe and unimpeded and yeah. whatever, you know, if a tree goes down, we'll take care of it mm-hmm. and um, do kind of some volunteer stuff just to, because there's people here all the time. Yeah. And then we let folks uh, take the dogs out on the beach, you know, after November through the winter. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty popular thing to do. No matter how much snow you've got when the tide's out, you know, you get some good walking access there. Well, here's a question for you on wildlife. Yeah. The, you go to the other side of the road, the... Um, uh, Great Cove? Yeah, Great Cove. Yep. You go down that way and become spruce grass habitat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which, yeah. Which is always interesting for people from away because that's a bird you can't get south of Bangor. Right. Do you get them over here in the park at all? No. Um, it's another thing about up in the Moosehead area was, you know, we used to do uh, hunting rough, rough grass all the time. Oh, but sure. Spruce grass are very few and far between. Yeah. Not quite the habitat. Yeah, there's a lot of rough grass out here. Partridge, I guess exactly. you call it. Yeah. And uh, if you're out here hiking, you flush them all the time. Yeah. So this is part of the old farm, mm-hmm. and uh, this is an apple orchard out here. Of course, in the spring when the blossoms are out, this is pretty spectacular. Oh, I can imagine and the bees come over from the blueberry fields next door. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're on holiday. <laughs> right. So, Richie, again, thanks for the tour. This was wonderful. And uh, because I don't have that many listeners, this will probably still stay a secret. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bob, again, thanks for coming out, taking the time to share this, uh, this beautiful place with you because that's, you know, we love to do that. Like I say, we get... I get a lot of folks down here to begin with, so when we do, it's always nice to uh, share it. Well, I, I happen to catch this in a, just about an absolutely perfect day, didn't I? Perfect day, Jeez. yeah. But in September here, is just spectacular. Yeah. Which means, thanks to the law of averages, the next three times I come, it'll all suck. <laughs> <laughs> little pea soup fog, yeah, little right. drizzle, <laughs> cold jackets, you know. <laughs> Rich Donaher is the manager at Rope Bluff State Park, and I certainly appreciate the tour. 
We've only got about five minutes left of today's show, and we will spend it on a puffin watch. Over the last couple of years, the Ilaho Ferry has been making once-a-week trips out to Seal Island, which is about 16 miles out to sea from Stonington. There's a big seabird colony out there where puffins are the main attraction. Puffins are wicked cute, and lots of people want to see them. For a month, I've been going along as their expert spotter because there are lots of other cool birds out there, too, and not everybody knows what they are. Now, I've done shows from the Ilaho Ferry before, and I'll be doing it again in the future. So I'm just going to squeeze a four-and-a-half-hour puffin boat trip into five minutes. Welcome aboard the Ilaho Ferry. Most of the time, this boat is running mail, passengers, and gear over to the island. It's a nonprofit that services the island, but, you know, this is too good a boat to be using only for that. So there are special trips that happen throughout the summer and fall. Every Sunday for the last month, the boat has been taking people out to see puffins at Seal Island. Today is the last puffin run of the season because they'll be leaving their nesting island soon. Uh, the boat will be doing some lighthouse tours later on in the season, too. So this boat is still staying busy. You probably know that I've got some experience bird guiding. I have my own tour company, and I guide privately and write birding columns in the Bangor Daily News. So I just sort of linked up naturally with this ferry to be their spotter on many of their puffin runs. Puffins are the main reason people go out to Seal Island. But there's actually a lot of other cool birds to see out here, and you see them along the way. In fact, uh, the puffins are so easy, you really don't need a spotter. There are hundreds of them waiting for us out there at the island today. So I, I spot the other stuff. It's 16 miles from Stonington to the island. It takes us almost two hours to get there, depending on how the seas are running. But it's a very scenic ride. We go by a bunch of islands, some of which are rocks with scores of seals hauled out on them, sunning. We go by Isla Ho. We go by a famous lighthouse called Saddleback Ledge, which I can now see in the distance. Uh, Seal Island belongs to the federal government as part of the main coastal island national wildlife refuge. And that's good because nobody else will want it anyway. It was used for a target practice during World War II right into the early 60s. The Navy bombed the daylights out of it. There's still the threat of unexploded ordnance out there. Now, there are wildlife biologists on the island monitoring the colonies of seals and seabirds, but they all know where they should go and shouldn't go. Puffins were reintroduced to this island back in the 80s, and now there are hundreds of pairs. This island is also the second largest pupping colony for gray seals in the eastern United States. Besides puffins, there are nesting razorbills and black guillemots, which are close cousins of the puffin, and a big colony of common and arctic terns. Seal Island is also the southernmost nesting uh, site for great cormorants, uh, so it's a pretty cool island that we're heading for. We're about halfway to the island. Wilson storm petrels are all around us. This is a small black bird that actually nests on islands off the southern tip of Argentina. Now, you know our birds go south for the winter. Did you ever wonder if southern birds go north for the winter? Well, the answer is yeah, some of them do. These tiny birds flood the ocean after nesting, and some people think it may be the most abundant bird in the world. A moment ago, we had a great shearwater cross the bow. Um, that's a bird that nests on four remote islands in the remotest section of the South Atlantic. They also come up here during their, their winter. Well, this is cool. I have, uh, I've never seen a whale on this passage, but I just had my first one last week a rather large minke whale. It's still here and it's got a friend. Two minke whales just surfaced right behind the boat. The swells are a, are a little big today. Bad weather passed through yesterday and now the winds are from the northeast. They're not really strong winds, but the remnant swells are giving us waves of up to about four feet. We're at the island. Lots of puffins. I mean lots of puffins. More than I had on the trip last week. The chicks actually stay in the underground burrows where they nest until they're old enough to go to sea, so we won't see any of those. But there are lots of puffins just loafing around in the water or standing on the rocks waiting. There are dozens of them rafted up right next to us now. We're in the lee of the island, so everything is calm, and everybody's taking lots of pictures of these cute puffins. There's a cove that is pretty sheltered from any breeze, and the entire north side of the island is usually pretty placid. So we're motoring along, picking up sightings of other birds. Usually this is where the gray seals congregate. Usually we see uh, gray seals around this area. They're stealing your material. <laughs> oh, here's one looking at us. Yeah. That's a gray seal right there. Yeah. Gray seal right Pretty there looking at us. A whole bunch of gray seals are staring at us from the water. 
One lone harbor seal is setting itself up in the rocks. So now we're heading down to the Great Cormorant Colony, it's right around the corner. Uh, sometimes, typically we do go around the entire island, but because of the swells that we're having, we're not going to do that today. We usually go around this 65-acre island, but the surf is uh, too big on the south side today, so we're just going to motor back down the lee side, and we'll head for home soon. We're about a third of the way back. Three parasitic Jaegers just flashed by the boat chasing a turn. Jaeger is the German word for hunter. These guys often feed themselves by stealing food from other birds. They're marauders, and that's what they're doing to that poor turn right now, chasing his tail all over the ocean until he drops his fish. Jaegers are unusual. They nest up in the subarctic. But later in summer, a few of them come down here to hassle the other birds, and we just got to watch that. Well, that's about all the time we've got. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Dice Arts, EBS, and Supercuts in Bangor, Brewer, and Old Town. Join me again every Saturday at 9, Sunday at 8, and online afterwards at 929theticket.com. From 16 miles out to sea, this is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket.